Well, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5 and verses 1 through 16 uh, this morning, but we're going to be focusing on Matthew chapter 5 and, and verse 3. And uh, this is a real important admonition that Jesus gave to the Lord. What we uh, discovered last week in our time together was that these admonitions in Matthew chapter 5 through uh, verse, really verse, uh, let's see, verse 10 and 11, uh, they've been called the Beatitudes of Jesus. And I was taught back when I first became a Christian that these are attitudes that Christians should seek after and should pursue in their lives is the way I was taught. And they're very controversial uh, Beatitudes. In fact, there are some in the Church of Jesus uh, that I, you know, really feel like that this sermon that Jesus gave really is not even relevant for the church today, that it was really for a church in the millennium, not a church today. But we believe that it is for the church today, and so we're looking forward to presenting these truths to you in what many call the Beatitude. And what Jesus did in these Beatitudes and in the sermon that followed is that he revealed to his disciples and to the multitudes that were listening to him, he revealed the major distinctions between the, those who follow him and those who don't follow him. He said, you want to know what those who follow me look like? Well, here you go. I'm getting ready to tell you. This is what those who follow me will look like. And obviously, if the disciples of Jesus that follow him look like this, and those who don't follow him won't look like this. He revealed the difference between what Paul called the natural man and the spiritual man, is what he was revealing in these particular uh, Beatitudes. And so he taught them these things on this particular day because he wanted them to know that if they would exhibit these characteristics that he was going to share with them, they would be the salt of the earth. They would be a city set on a hill. They would be the light of the world. They would manifest who he is to the world if they had these particular characteristics in their lives. So that's what this, this whole series is about. It's being more like Jesus. As we talk about today being poor in spirit, we're going to show you that Jesus was poor in spirit. Yeah, that's what the first beatitude that we'll be looking at. And if you have your Bible with you this morning, and I hope you do, I hope you'll open with us to Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to look at verse 3 at this first beatitude. And this is what the first beatitude is. It says in Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, in this list of Beatitudes, Jesus did not come up with these Beatitudes or their order arbitrarily. Jesus is always intentional. He is an intentional leader. He is an intentional teacher. There's a reason why this Beatitude is first. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The first beatitude that Jesus shared in this sermon to introduce his most famous sermon is a beatitude on which all the rest are built. Every other beatitude is built on this one, poor in spirit. An understanding of what it means to be poor in spirit is essential to understanding Jesus's Sermon. In fact, without this understanding of what it is to be poor in spirit, this entire sermon will be lost mm -hmm. on us. We won't be able to understand it. Because from the very beginning, the idea of this message is that we cannot live out the life of God without Him. And in order to have Him in our lives, in order for His life to be lived through us, we must be poor in spirit. Jesus said, in fact, that the poor in spirit would be the ones, get this, who would inherit the kingdom of heaven. Do you want to inherit the kingdom of heaven? Jesus said, you must be poor in spirit. All the other beatitudes are built on being poor in spirit. 
Why is this? One of my favorite theologians that I've been reading for 40-something years now is Martin Lloyd-Jones. In fact, he's got a little book called The Sermon on the Mount that I would encourage you to pick up and read sometime. And I want to read to you a quote by Martin Lloyd-Jones. And he explains why all the other Beatitudes are built upon this particular attitude. Let me read to you what he said. He said, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus comes to us and says, there is this mountain that you have to scale, the height you have to climb, and the first thing that you must realize as you look at this mountain, which you're told you must ascend, is that you cannot do it. You cannot do it, he said. That you are utterly incapable in and of yourself and that any attempt to do it in your own strength is proof positive that you have not understood it. It condemns at the very outset the view which regards it as a program for man to put into operation immediately just as he is. And so it's with that understanding that we are going to dive into what it means to be poor in spirit. In fact, we're going to dive into this particular uh, beatitude, being poor in spirit, like our whole life and future as a Christian depends upon this. And the reason we're going to do that is because I want you to realize this morning is that it does. It does. Yeah, it does. So let's listen to what Jesus says and let's discover three things together this morning about what it means to be poor in spirit. So th these are the three questions that will guide our discussion on this sermon this morning. The first one is, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? When Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, what did he mean? And the second one is, what do you need to do if you are poor in spirit? Oh, what a, what a gift. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. If you become poor in spirit, if you are poor in spirit, what do you need to do? And then third, how will becoming poor in spirit and turning to Jesus change your life? So these are our three. And so let's learn what it means to be poor in spirit. Let's understand it. Let's, let's, uh, I, I tell people that unless you can visualize something, you can't make any change. And so you got to first visualize it. And one of the benefits of studying the Greek language is that it really gives us images that we can wrap our mind around to understand the scriptural concepts that we're trying to learn. And so what does it mean to be poor in spirit? Well, the word poor, as it's used here in the Bible, means to be financially bankrupt. It means that your only way to survive is to beg someone else for assistance. That's what it means to be poor. Now, I have never been poor in my whole life that I can ever remember uh, financially. I've never been bankrupt. I've never had to go to someone and just beg them to help me for my survival. You know, where I wasn't gonna be able to eat or, or drink if they didn't help me. I've never been in that position. Some of you, the, I know you have been in that place. You've been that poor financially that you needed assistance and help in order to survive. So that's what the word poor in Greek means. It means that you're financially bankrupt and you're at a point where your only way to survive is to go and beg someone else for, for help. The word, the Greek word poor comes from a word that means to fall, like fall on your face, to prostrate yourself is what that word poor means. It means to prostrate yourself on your face before another that you're asking to help you or to give you some kind of assistance. Now that body language, body language is very important to God. I mean, throughout his word, he gives us all of these ways to express ourselves physically. And one of the ways that he gives us a, 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 an opportunity to express our poverty is by bowing before him, bowing before him. This Greek word comes from a word that means to fall 
or to prostrate yourself before another that you're seeking assistance from. And this physical action of bowing or prostrating yourself was a sign of humility. And right now in our society, we see the poor all over our city. There's hardly anywhere in our city you can't go and see those who are poor financially and they're standing on street corners asking for assistance. And we frequently have poor people come by the church office asking for assistance. And I'm grateful to say if any member of our church becomes truly truly poor, and you're a member of our church, uh, we have the resources to help our members with what they need when they come and they ask for it. So to be poor, that's what it means financially. To be poor in spirit, Jesus said though. To be poor in spirit means to be spiritually bankrupt. Think about that. To be spiritually bankrupt. In other words, instead of being poor financially or physically and begging for physical assistance, to be poor in spirit means you're begging someone to help you with the bankrupt condition of your soul. Wow. That's incredible, isn't it? To be poor in spirit, to be begging someone to help you because you've come to a place where you realize that your soul is bankrupt. Okay. Man, I mean, that's powerful imagery. I mean, you could imagine if I was financially poor and at your feet right now begging that, that act of humility and what that body language communicates. And this, Jesus is saying poor in spirit is like, I'm, I'm at his feet, just bankrupt. And, you know, if you're poor financially, normally... No one needs to convince you that you're poor financially. I don't need any convincing. Normally, I mean, right? You're pretty right. aware of it if you're poor. I, now, I've known a couple people who maybe couldn't pay the bills and they were still eating out and going to Starbucks and, you know, things like that. So maybe sometimes we need some convincing. Yeah, a lot of people run up credit card debt and they don't think they're poor, but they're really upside down right. because they don't have enough assets to pay off their debt. And so they're bankrupt, they just haven't declared it yet. Right, and so sometimes you can be poor financially and not have acknowledged it yet. But I think in most cases, people who are poor financially know that they are poor financially. It's evident you can't buy food, you can't pay your bills, you can't get a loan. All these things become really evident whenever you're poor financially. But you know, this is not true of someone spiritually. It's different spiritually. Most people are not aware that they need to be poor in spirit or that they are spiritually bankrupt. We've got to convince them. We've got to convince. That's what our job is as preachers, right? Yeah. You and I, we're supposed to stand up and we're supposed to convince you that you're bankrupt spiritually. Yeah. Do you know how challenging that is with human beings to do that, to accomplish that? In, in fact, it's impossible. Yeah, Jesus knew how challenging it was, and he, he knew that the Jews who were listening to this message really needed it because they had this sense of entitlement. Because we're children of Abraham, you know, God owes us something. They, they needed to believe that their souls were bankrupt. The vast majority of Americans that attend church, they, they really need this same understanding, that their soul is bankrupt. There was, because of this sense of entitlement that we're children of Abraham, they thought that they deserved something from God. I see that all the time. I I can tend to drift that way. And I've seen that so many times in the church that people feel as though God owes them something. That is not being poor in spirit. If we received what we were due, we would receive death and separation from God eternally because of our sin. That's spiritually bankrupt. God, you don't owe me anything and any spiritual blessing, all these beatitudes, blessed are you, any spiritual blessing I receive from you is not because I deserve it, but because you are good. And it's that change, it's that belief in our soul that has the power to make us aware of just how spiritually bankrupt we really are. So Jesus comes to this society of Jews. Many of those Jews are very self-righteous. They think that their religion 
has made them right with Jehovah God. And he comes to them, and he's got this challenging mission that he's been given by his father that he's got to persuade them that they're spiritually bankrupt. It wasn't a very popular message among that group of people. And so he comes to them, and one thing about Jesus that is pretty clear in the Gospels, because he is the God-man, by the way, he's very persuasive when it comes to convincing people that they're spiritually bankrupt. Very convincing. And so he gives them these admonitions in this servant sermon that are going to drive this point home. In other words, he's going to show them through this sermon just how bankrupt they are. Well, it wasn't a very popular message. In this message called the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5 through 7, he confronts their spiritual pride. They didn't know they were spiritual bankrupt. They didn't want to be told they were spiritual bankrupt. They thought they were good people. They thought they were righteous people. They thought they were the holy people of God, the chosen people of God. They thought they had it all together. And in this one sermon, Jesus comes and he begins to tear down all of their assumptions about who they were. Wow, that is incredible. You see, what they had is this group of Jewish people in the time that he lived, they had an overinflated view of themselves. You know what that's called throughout the Bible? Anytime a human being has an overinflated view of themselves, it's called pride. Pride. So if you want to know what the opposite of being poor in spirit is, the opposite is pride, having an overinflated view of yourself. And so this sermon that Jesus gave should have been sufficient to just convince every one of them that they were evil sinners and that their souls were totally bankrupt. And so what does he do? Well, he begins to make these real clear applications throughout the sermon. Very specific to Jewish society at that time. You may look at some of these applications and go, you know what? I really can't relate to that one. Well, you weren't supposed to necessarily re relate to it. You can still apply it in your circumstances. But see, Jesus had an awareness of what was going on in that society at that time like no one else did. And so he gives these very specific applications of what these Beatitudes would look like in the way that these Jews lived out their lives. But he's, he's doing it to try to help them come to a place where they understand that they are spiritually bankrupt. That their souls are bankrupt. And so what does he do? Well, he condemned annulling the commandments of God. This is not the only place that he did it in this sermon. He did it later on. He talked to the Pharisees and he told them, look, you're annulling the commandments of God. I mean, you're, you're not taking care of your own family, your parents. You're saying to your own parents that I, whatever you had to help your parents is, I've given it to God. Really? So they annulled the commandments of God in order to fulfill their own traditions. And Jesus condemns that in this sermon. He condemned murder. Well, everybody in that society knew that murder was wrong. It's right there in the law of Moses. But no, he went a step beyond that. He condemned murder in their hearts. Being angry in their hearts against others, he condemned that. And then Jesus condemned adultery. But not just physical adultery with another person. He committed, a, he condemned adultery in their hearts. All, he, what he was showing is, you guys are spiritually bankrupt. That's what he was showing them. He condemned divorce for any reason. I mean, men in this society, they were just putting away their wives for any reason. You know, she wasn't as good looking as she used to be. She didn't cook as good. Uh, she didn't cook as well as she used to. She's not cleaning house like she once did. I mean, and they were divorcing their wives for any reason. And Jesus condemns divorce for any reason. 
In this sermon, he condemned making false vows. It was very popular to make these vows unto God and really do it before men to really demonstrate just how godly and holy you were, and then they wouldn't keep the vows. And when they'd make the vows, they would swear. They would swear upon heaven that they would keep the vow, or they'd swear upon the earth, or they would swear even upon the hair on their head. This is the truth. I will keep this vow. Jesus condemned swearing and making false vows. He condemned seeking retaliation against their enemies. They were all about retaliation. Let me tell you something. They were all about justice. They were all about social justice. And they wanted the Romans out, and they wanted to be in charge. And they wanted the Romans to be judged by God for what the Romans had done to them. I mean, they were all about re retaliation. And Jesus condemns retaliation in this sermon. And then what about hating your enemies? They were really good at it. They were okay with loving their neighbors, but they weren't good at loving their enemies. Jesus condemned hating their enemies. He condemned practicing their righteousness before men. Is a major part of the middle of the sermon in Matthew chapter 6. He condemned laying up treasures on earth where people are just working to gain and gain and gain and gain treasures in this world. He condemned that. He condemned judging others. When you've got a log in your own eye that you should be taken care of. And so Jesus was very persuasive. This sermon is incredible. All of the rest of the message, after beginning in verse 17, is built upon all of these beatitudes in the first uh, 16 verses. And all of those beatitudes that come before poor in spirit are built upon this one verse. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now I want you to imagine being there hearing this sermon. And you're thinking... You're hearing this man preach. And you know, last week we talked about who he is, that he is God, that he is King Jesus. You know, those who rejected that claim could be very proud in their hearts and just ugh, dismiss everything he said. But for the, in those whom the Spirit of God was moving and those walls of pride were coming down, it's like, imagine everything you ever did being exposed by this preacher and the Holy Spirit just falling heavy with conviction. Have you ever experienced that before? Like where all of a sudden it's like, oh, God is just showing me. I'm be, I just feel undone because of what I'm seeing about myself. That is understanding that you are poor in spirit. And there's a really important question we need to ask next. The second question is, what do you need to do if you become poor in spirit? You are poor in spirit, but if you become aware of it, if you see your need, if you know I am spiritually bankrupt, what do you need to do? Well, you need to turn to God. You need to turn, and, and it's important that I say that because our tendency as people is to drift away from God and we could turn to other things besides God to try to satisfy or fill up or meet these needs when we become aware of just how evil we are apart from him. When we become, we, we become aware just how broken we are in our spirit apart from him, the tendency can be to turn to something besides God. You need to turn to to God. But what God will you turn to? Will it be some other God or will it be the one true God who is the preacher of this sermon? Yeah. Jesus Christ. He is God. Jesus not only taught the Jews that they needed to be poor in spirit, to recognize that they are poor in spirit, but he taught them that they needed to turn to him to save them from their spiritual poverty. That he, in fact, was the only one who could do that for them. That their traditions could not do that for them. That their religion could not do that for them. That their family, that they were children of Abraham, could not do that for them. And don't you know that people in the church are still looking to those kind of things yeah. in their poverty of soul? Mm -hmm. None of those things will do it for you. Only Jesus can do this for you. Jesus proved that he was God by the signs he performed and the prophecies that he fulfilled. He is the King of Kings. Yeah. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the God man. Jesus promised that if anyone would follow him, remember that last week, that they would draw close to him, 
be in proximity with him, if they would walk with him and become like him. Jesus promised many things. Spiritual blessings would be poured out from heaven, but two very specific things to what we're talking about this morning. Jesus promises that if anyone would follow him, he will save them from judgment on sin. What a promise. Here's what we're talking about here. Go back to the financial illustration. We're talking about this massive debt you owe because of sin that you cannot pay. We're talking about this very thing, sin, that causes you to be poor in spirit. Beyond your own means to handle your own redemption with God. God must act or you remain poor in spirit. You remain bankrupt. God promised, Jesus promised, if you will follow me, I will save you from the judgment yeah. of sin. I will erase save your you sin did. debt. What an exciting news. It means I owe all this money, and all of a sudden, my debt is wiped out. What an incredible promise. But here's what's exciting, church. The promise doesn't stop there. Now my account's at zero. I don't owe anything anymore. But here's the second thing he promises. Jesus promised that if anyone would follow him, he would give them his life. Yeah. Here's what that means, that he would overload their bank account. Yeah, that the spiritual on. blessings that he would pour out in your life would not only satisfy you, but cause you to be overflowing with the life of God, with the love of God, with the blessings of God, with an inheritance from God. This is the promise of Jesus. He says, if you recognize you are poor in spirit and you turn to me, I will satisfy you. I will fill yeah. you up. Amen. When we recognize we are spiritually bankrupt, if we turn to Jesus, here's what the scripture's saying, you'll become like him. Yeah. You'll become more, more like, like Jesus, him. more of his life in you, more of his words in you, more of his teachings in you. What a change. You know there's no one better than Jesus, right? That if you could try to become like anyone, he would be the absolute best person to try to be like. There is no one better than Jesus. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount with these Beatitudes, he fulfilled all the blessed admonitions in the Sermon on the Mount. All of them. Perfectly. He never messed up. He never had to make amends with anyone because he never wronged anyone. He never sinned against anyone. He wants to live his life through you so that your life looks like that. Wow. So, if you are poor in spirit, what do you need to do? You need to turn to Jesus and depend on him. He's the only one who can not only settle your sin debt, but cause your life to overflow with the blessings of heaven. So how will becoming poor in spirit and turning to Jesus change you? Well, we looked at the rest of the sermon in an overview just a moment ago, and I told you that Jesus spoke those admonitions to condemn these things in the Jews so that they would become poor in spirit and realize their, the need in their soul that they were bankrupt spiritually. But at the very same time, it's like a two-edged sword. The commands of Jesus not only bring us into a place of poverty in spirit, but they also raise for us a standard that shows what he's like. Every one of these admonitions in the rest of the sermon are, this is what Jesus is like. This is the way he lived his life. For example, if you will turn to Jesus after you're poor in spirit and really look to him to fill your bankrupt soul, then it will cause you to put away other sinful attitudes that you have in your life. And we're going to talk about those other sinful attitudes in the upcoming weeks. It will cause you to put away dismissing the commandments of God and making excuses for not keeping the commandments of God. If you will turn to Jesus, it will cause you to put away murder in your heart. If you will turn to Jesus, it will cause you to put away adultery in your heart. It will cause you to put away divorce for any reason. It will cause you to put away swearing falsely. If you turn to Jesus, it will cause you to put away retaliation. It will cause you to put away hate for your enemies. It will cause you to put away practicing your righteousness before men. It will cause you to put away laying up treasures on earth. It will cause you to put away worry and anxiety. It will cause you to put away judging others unrighteously. It will cause you, as Paul said, to put off the old man and put on the new man. How exciting is that? 
that you will be able, if you will turn to Jesus because you're poor in spirit and your soul, you'll be able to put on the new man. And Paul said that new man is like Christ. All these things will follow you if you will uh, become poor in spirit and turn to Jesus to save you. Yeah, so we have to ask this morning, have you ever done that? Have you ever recognized that you are poor in spirit and just put yourself at the feet of Jesus like someone who's bankrupt financially and can't feed themselves and begged, Jesus, save me. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, without you, I am stuck right here. Have you ever turned to him like that? If you haven't, that's the call of Jesus for you this morning. If you're recognizing right now, I am spiritually bankrupt, the call is to turn to Jesus, to follow him, to let him take that sin debt and erase it, and then fill your account, overwhelm your account. It's the best thing. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about exchanging your old life for a new one. I'm talking about exchanging an old way for a better way. If you've never done that, that's the first thing we want to lead you to this morning, is that you would make that decision, that you would fall at the feet of Jesus, put yourself flat on your face and say, Jesus, I am so poor in spirit. Jesus, my soul is bankrupt. Jesus, please save me from my sin. And from the judgment I rightly deserve, give me your life. I want to follow you. I just wonder if everyone would bow in prayer right now. If that's you this morning, if you're bankrupt in your soul and you haven't turned to Jesus yet, would you turn to him right now? He is here. He is listening to your heart and your thoughts and aware of your response to him. Just say, Jesus, I am so bankrupt in my soul. And Jesus, please save me. Now, if that's you this morning, we're all bowed in prayer right now. If you're turning to Jesus because of the, of the bankruptcy of your soul, and you know that you need him to save you, and you're crying out right now in your heart, Jesus, save me, would you just raise your hand and say, that's me right now. That's, that's where I met. Jesus, save me. I need you. I see those hands. Thank you. I know the Lord sees those hands too, but he is so aware of your condition right now. You know, that's why he came because of how aware he is of your condition. And he didn't want you to stay like that. So he said, I'm gonna wipe out your sin debt. And I want you to know right now, if you cried out to Jesus this morning, trusting that he's the only one who can save you from your sin, and you said, Jesus save me, I just wanna to proclaim to you this truth of the gospel. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. In Jesus' name, your sins are forgiven. He's cleared your slate. He wipes them out because that's who he is. Not only that, but the life of God is now in you because God promises, Jesus promises that for those who receive him, receive his spirit. So that the life of God can be lived in you so that this mountain of this Sermon on the Mount, these commands that are impossible for us in our own strength become possible, not as we live according to the flesh, but as we walk by the spirit the life of God lived in us. Now I want you to look up at me right now. I'm moved, I know some of you are moved. I want you to know what you need to do in response to this. If you raised your hand just now and you were crying out to Jesus, or if you did that a month ago or a week ago or a day ago or 10 years ago, if you have not followed Jesus in baptism, this is how we profess him as Lord. This is how we proclaim his as, as king. Jesus is the one who instituted baptism. 
He said that if you want to follow me, the first step is to be baptized. If the Lord is prompting you right now, you have that new life, child. You are mine, child. I have taken care of this sin debt for you. You have my life. Rise up and be free. I want to invite you right now to rise up and come up here and follow the Lord in baptism. Who needs to do it right now? Rise up. Who is, who's following Jesus today? Who's decided to follow him? Would you rise up and respond to him by following him in baptism? The call's right now. We'll wait on you. I believe Jesus is stirring this. I promise you this, that if you walk in obedience to God, you will not regret it. Just take that first step of faith and trust him. He is so, so good. And you know, we're his people. If you respond to him, we're just gonna celebrate. He's in us. There's no reason to feel any embarrassment or fear. This is a safe place for you to seek Jesus. Who needs to follow him? Would you rise up right now and come forward? Well, here's what I believe. I believe that Jesus is stirring hearts this morning. If you have not, if you didn't get up, but you know you're supposed to, here's what I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna ask Pastor Hugh, one of our pastors, if you just go stand right there in the back for the rest of this message. And at any point, you can respond and you can choose to go back there and talk to him. He's the pastor who helps us facilitate our baptisms, who talks with people as they're responding to Jesus. Just go visit with Pastor Hugh this morning and uh, we'd love to talk to you about that. There's also a connect card in the chair that you can fill out and let us know that you wanna to talk to a pastor about being baptized. So thank you for that opportunity to give that strong call this morning. May you follow Jesus and not worry about anything else. Now, before we dismiss, we have a call for those of you who have already decided to follow Jesus. Pastor Brain, I think probably we need to end here. Okay. And we can pick up on that next week. But in this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus understood that there was going to be people who weren't poor in spirit that were going to act like they were his followers. He talks about them at the end of the message in the Sermon on the Mount. He talks about a group of folks that they're doing all these good works in Jesus' name. But he says to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. You workers of iniquity. I mean, he talks about them. I mean, they're casting out demons in his name. That's a pretty good work. I mean, they're healing people in his name, and that's a good work. And he said, I never knew you. Well, how in the world did they miss it? They missed it because they never came to him in poverty of spirit to begin with. They missed it. Let me ask you a question. If you profess to know Jesus, what characterizes your character to the person that's closest to you? I mean, would they, would they describe you as someone who shows them Jesus every day in the way that you treat them? Or would they describe you as someone who hurts them on a regular basis? Someone who's mean? Someone who perhaps is even abusive verbally to them? Or maybe if it's not verbally abusive it's in the sound of your words you see it's real easy 
It's real easy to hide where you're really at spiritually from the rest of the church, but you can't hide it from the people that you're closest to. Are you like Jesus to them? You should be concerned if you're not. You could be, it's not, this is not one of those things you fake it until you make it. I mean, you, you either have the genuine article, Jesus, in you, living out his life and character through you, or you don't. Right. I mean, Paul said in Romans 8, if you don't have the spirit of Jesus, you're none of his. And if you have the spirit of Jesus, what will characterize you in the, in the relationships of the people that you're closest to will be the fruit of the spirit. Yeah. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, in the way that you relate to them. Do you really know Jesus? Have you ever been spiritually bankrupt? Yeah. Where you went before God and you saw this condition of your soul and you said, oh, wretched man that I am, oh, wretched woman that I am, my soul is a mess. Mm. And you turned to Jesus to save you from what a wicked and evil and vile person you were. That's being spiritually bankrupt. Another way you can tell if you've ever had this experience, if you've ever been spiritually bankrupt, it's hard to judge people. You have to work at it. Yeah. When you're spiritually bankrupt, it's hard to point the finger at other people and say, wow, what a lousy person that is. Yeah. Why is that? Because you've come to an awareness of your own spiritual bankruptcy without Jesus. How can you judge other people yeah. the way that you do? If Jesus is in you, you can't do it. So this is the other part of this invitation. I want to rock your boat. How do you treat the people or maybe the person that you're closest to? I mean, is it all about you? Or is it all about Jesus and honoring Jesus and the way you treat them? Which is it? Yeah. If you've never been spiritually bankrupt and you think you're secure, let the words of Jesus remind you What's at stake here? Away from me, I never knew you. Because you never became poor in spirit in this world while you had the opportunity. Let's pray together. And that'll be the other part of our invitation this morning. Have you ever, ever been poor in spirit? Folks, come on. I don't care if your, your name's on the membership rolls of our church. That's not going to get you to heaven. Right. I don't care if you've ever been baptized in this church or five other churches. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. It doesn't matter how many good works you've done, how many gifts that you've given in Jesus' name to bless other people. It doesn't matter. You're not going to get into the kingdom of heaven unless you've been poor in spirit. Are you there yet? Are you there? Lord, bring them there. Yes. Bring us all there, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Now, here's what you need to do. You need to do this. If you're a church member, and what I have said to you has created doubt, well, hallelujah. You need to find out be between you and the Lord where you really stand. And don't let someone deter you don't let someone say oh you know you're not that bad of a person no you know you're a person of faith hey let's get honest with God are you how do the people closest to you describe you in the way that you treat them are you poor in spirit Here's what I want you to do. Church members, if you're not certain, have you ever had that experience before? Well, have it right now, first of all. Just yeah. do it right now. Right. Just say, Lord, I'm bankrupt before you. My soul is a mess without you. Right. I am a wicked, evil, vile sinner without you. Mm -hmm. And right now, Lord, 
I confess. I'm not just a, 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 someone who sins. I'm a sinner. Lord, save me. And he'll do it. Right now, he'll do it. That's what he's waiting for. It's for you to do that as a church member if you don't know him. And he doesn't know you. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you for what you're doing. In Jesus' name. Now look up just a moment. I, I knew a pastor's wife many years ago who heard a sermon like this and she realized she had never been saved. And she'd been serving her husband for years. And she went, had never been saved. And the reason she had never been saved is because she had never become poor in spirit before a holy God and then cast herself upon Jesus to save her. Yeah. She'd gone through the motions all of those years, even became a pastor's wife, and she was lost going to hell. Hey, it can happen to anyone. The devil is so deceptive. Don't let him deceive you. Yeah. We'll follow up this next week on, yeah, you can come into Jesus. How do we live this out as yeah. Christians, being poor in spirit, in our own personal lot, walking with him? We're going to talk about that next week. So we're going to...